This video is going to be all about plug-in hybrids. It's the new and improved edition, now with more eRev. And if you don't know what that means, good, because we're going to explore all the different types of plug-in hybrids. Basically, any vehicle that has both a plug to recharge and a gas tank to refill is a plug-in hybrid. The basics of how they work, advantages and disadvantages compared to other vehicles. So whether you're looking to buy a plug-in hybrid or just a little buy curious, you've clicked on the right video. At its most basic, your car can either use fuel or electricity for energy. A plug-in hybrid electric vehicle uses fuel and electricity. It has both a cap to refill and a plug to recharge. Going a layer deeper, the overwhelming majority of cars today burn gas or diesel. Fuel is burned inside an engine. That's why we call it an internal combustion engine or ICE because engineers love acronyms. Since fuel is being burned, there is exhaust, which has caused environmental problems for decades, smog, acid rain, and now climate change concerns caused by greenhouse gases like CO2. An electric vehicle should really be called a battery electric vehicle or BEV, uses electricity stored in a battery that drives an electric motor. It has no tailpipe, but the electricity does have to come from somewhere, so they are not completely guilt-free when it comes to CO2, but they are much more efficient. Heat, noise, and vibration are all forms of energy loss in a combustion engine. Hybrid electric vehicles like the Toyota Prius use a small battery and a small electric motor to improve the efficiency of the combustion engine. Some will call them electrified. It still only burns gasoline, but it produces fewer emissions because it is more efficient. The next category combines a hybrid and an electric vehicle, so it's called a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Oh, oh. Here I come. Oh, here I come. And because engineers love acronyms, it's a PHEV. Some will pronounce it FEV. If you plug it in, it can drive maybe 15 miles or more on electricity alone. And it also has a gas tank for when the battery runs out. The car will automatically switch between electricity and gas power. This is the type of vehicle we're going to talk about. Now, before explaining the difference between a PHEV and an EREV, I begrudgingly need to talk about a hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle. To make things simple, I'm going to say, forget about it. Hydrogen may only make sense for really large things, and even then, they have a lot to prove. Two years ago, when I did the first version of this video, sales expectations for PHEVs were modest. About one new PHEV would be sold for every five battery electrics. And I think those numbers need to change. When you look at the China market, what's happening over there, they're much further along on the transition to electric. And sales of BEVs continue to grow, but PHEVs have rapidly caught up. BYD, who only makes battery electrics and plug-in hybrids, they now sell at a 60-40 mix with PHEVs outselling BEVs. So we can expect to see a shift over here as well. I'll put a link to the original video in the notes. The most common response in the comments was from people who own a PHEV and they love it. Here are some examples. Feel free to check out the comments in that earlier video. There are two types of plug-in hybrids to know about. A lot of innovation is happening in this space. I'm gonna call the first type a traditional PHEV. Engineers call this a parallel system. Virtually all the plug-in hybrids available in the US today are of this type. Essentially, you take an internal combustion engine vehicle, add an electric motor, often integrated into the transmission, plus a battery that's smaller than a full battery electric, but larger than a hybrid. With this, you electrify an internal combustion engine vehicle. That's why they're popular with automakers. You can convert just about any gas-powered vehicle to be a traditional PHEV. Aside from adding an extra door on the body for recharging, you'll hardly notice the difference. Range running on electricity alone is pretty modest, but often enough to commute to work without starting the engine. If you nail the accelerator hard, the engine comes on. When the battery runs low, the engine comes on. If you plan to take a long trip, you just stop at gas stations as needed. The other type I'm gonna talk about is an extended range EV because they have a range extender. You'll also hear them called EREV or sometimes REV, same thing. Engineers call this a series plug-in hybrid. 
They start with a battery electric vehicle platform and then add a gas engine to generate electricity. The engine is not actually a generator like shown in the picture, but some people have tried to do this. Don't try that. That engine does not drive the wheels directly. It is only there to recharge the battery. And the best example of this is the old BMW i3 with the range extender option and the new upcoming Ram Ram charger. I told you there was innovation happening in this area. Generally, e-revs have much longer electric only range, like over 100 miles. Got it? Good, because it's going to get more complex as some e-revs can actually function like a traditional PHEV, a series design, under certain conditions where the gas engine is putting power to the wheels and at other times it's only there to generate electricity. Some engineers are starting to call this type of a system a series parallel configuration, a combination of the two. BYD sells the Shark pickup in some markets, including Mexico. It works like that. So it's not always easy to differentiate between a PHEV and an EREV. If you hear the vehicle called a PHEV, it's probably a traditional design that drives like a gas power vehicle, the engine kicking in under hard acceleration and modest electric only range. EREVs are much less common for now, but new ones are coming. Scout announced an EREV powertrain option coming late 2026. They accelerate smoothly like a battery EV and have longer electric only range. Let's look at what it's like to drive and own a PHEV compared to other types of vehicles, including gasoline powered and full battery electrics. Traditional PHEVs that are based on a combustion engine platform accelerate well on electricity alone, as good or better than a gas only vehicle. Running only on electricity, they feel smooth and quiet. Now, if you hit the accelerator harder, if you drive up a hill, or if the battery is low, the gas engine automatically kicks in. It roars to life to provide more power. But it also reminds you how annoying a combustion engine can sound. Honda does make a very smooth four-cylinder engine and you barely notice it when it kicks in on this PHEV. Jeep Wrangler is a rugged off-roader, not known for its sophistication or sound insulation. When its four-cylinder kicks in, you do notice it. PHEVs generally will not have blistering, stupid fast acceleration like a battery EV, but hey, that just means you'll spend less money on speeding tickets. Now, there are some premium plugins who take advantage of electric motors to make them faster. Ferrari and McLaren both have a plug-in model to ease their clientele into a greener future while still torching tires. What I just described is a traditional or parallel plug-in system. Virtually all the PHEVs available to buy today are of this type, but we're going to see some series plug-in or EREVs hit the road soon. And what should we expect from them? They drive more like a full electric until the battery starts to get low. Going back to the BMW i3 example, it is a battery EV that just happened to offer a range extender engine as an option. If the battery has been charged, it'll drive like a battery electric. Smooth, snappy acceleration, quiet, you know, kind of fun. When the battery gets low or the load is high, like going up a hill or highway driving, the system may decide to fire up that range extender engine to start recharging the battery. The biggest difference is that the engine generator RPM won't go up and down with the vehicle speed. It will operate at a constant RPM that the system determines is appropriate and efficient so it won't rev up and down. It will just turn on. Assuming the engineers do their job and insulate against noise, vibration, harshness, NVH, you probably won't notice any of this playing over the music. Both types of PHEVs will emit a tone driving 18 miles per hour or slower. This is a requirement of NHTSA. When you hear the vehicle drive by on electricity only, it will sound futuristic. This is to make sure pedestrians can hear them coming since there is no engine noise. With PHEVs, the manufacturer will usually provide some basic control over how the limited amount of electricity gets used in the vehicle. Automakers have different names for them and here are some of the basic modes. If you want to prioritize using the battery first, there's a mode for that. Some call it eco, others will call it electric mode. 
if you want a balance between using the battery and the gas engine so that you don't use up all your battery right away, that may be called hybrid mode. If you want to save your battery for use later, like when you get to a city center and prioritize using the gas engine now while you're on the highway, Jeep calls that e-save, BMW calls that battery preserve, and Honda calls it HV mode. For whatever PHEV you may be looking at, consult the owner's manual or check out some how-to videos on YouTube. My recommendation is to just leave it in the default setting. Don't try to outthink the system. That's the advantage of a PHEV. Just plug it in as often as you can. When the gas gauge starts to get close to empty, you fill it with fuel. It's that easy. Do this in daily driving, and I would expect you to drive more than 60% of your miles on electricity alone. People with shorter commutes and less highway miles may be well above that. Where you work, they may offer charging, but only plug in if there are plenty of spaces available. I'll go over charging next. It's more considerate to leave them for owners of battery electric vehicles to use since they don't have gasoline to fall back on. When you head out of town, long distances, just focus on putting gas in the tank. When you get to a hotel, there may be charging you can use or you can plug in wherever you're staying, but don't stress about it too much. Some people say PHEVs offer the best of both worlds, but there's something to keep in mind. If you don't plug in your plug-in hybrid, you should probably just buy a hybrid. I'll go over the numbers to prove that, but first, let me try to demystify EV charging. Since this is all about PHEVs, I'll keep it simple. This is all you need. A level one charger plugged into a regular outlet that you can find in your garage or outside your house. It's easy, and for PHEVs, it's really all they need. They don't have a battery as large as a full battery electric. So if you're considering a plug-in hybrid, look where you park at home. If there's an outlet nearby, go for it. Automakers do not recommend using an extension cord since it may not be properly sized and it can cause other problems. What's better than a level one charger? A level two, of course, but it requires a 240 volt plug. Your home likely already has a 240 volt plug somewhere, but it's in the basement for an electric clothes dryer or in the kitchen for an electric oven. To effectively do level two charging at home, you need a 240 volt line run to the garage or to the driveway where you park. Level two chargers deliver more power to the battery. Some cities and states are requiring new homes to include a 240 volt outlet in the garage when it's being built. It's a minimal expense to add at that point. Adding to an existing home, you should check with your local utility. They'll have a website dedicated to EV charging, showing off what rebates are available and what contractors they suggest. There are lots of rebates, state and federal tax programs to consider. Another popular source is QMerit, where you can upload some pictures, answer a few questions, and they'll give you a quote all online. The work to install a 240 volt outlet for a level two charger can get expensive, but it's a good investment in your home's value. If you don't wanna pay that, again, a level one charger in a regular outlet is all you really need for a PHEV. You can find level two chargers at other destinations as well, like work, a hotel, shopping malls, anywhere where you plan to stay a few hours. At some big box stores, the prices are cheap because they want you to stay there for a while and shop. Then we get to DC chargers. Some will call these level three, but technically that's not the right term. Most PHEVs do not DC fast charge. Some of the new advanced E-REVs will because they're basically a battery EV underneath with a gas generator and a large EV battery. In general, most PHEVs do just fine with level one charging in a regular outlet. Plug it in like that and you'll burn a lot less gas. And now we get to the plugs. Since we're talking about PHEVs in the US, this is the only plug you really need to know. It's the SAE J1772 plug or the J plug. Tesla has a different plug, but they don't make any PHEVs. All others use the J plug for AC charging. To charge faster, they use the CCS plug, combined charging system. That is everyone except the Nissan Leaf and a couple of older EVs who use CHAdeMO. It's very rare for PHEVs to DC fast charge because they have a relatively smaller battery. Upcoming e-revs like the Ram Ram Charger will DC fast charge, 
but for PFs on the road today, it's just not necessary. Confusing, right? The good news is that Tesla offered their plugs to other automakers as NAX. SAE developed an independent standard called J3400. Eventually, everyone will use the Tesla-style plug in North America. But in the meantime, automakers are offering adapters to get us through this transition. In summary, for plug-in hybrids, it's the J-plug for now. And a level 1 charger that probably came with the vehicle when plugged into a properly wired 120-volt outlet is really all you need for a PHEV. As we come towards the end of this video, I'll go back to a message I said earlier. If you don't plug in your plug-in hybrid, then just buy a hybrid. The numbers show that it's not worth the extra cost of the PHEV to drive around with a feature that you're not using. Hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and battery EVs are capable of regenerative braking to recapture energy and put it back into the battery. A traditional braking system uses friction to stop the vehicle. The energy of motion is turned into heat and just released into the air. Regenerative braking turns that motion into electricity that goes back into the battery. This is also something that may be adjustable in a plug-in hybrid. I like the regen set to its highest setting whenever possible. It's more efficient, but it's also convenient. In stop and go traffic or in communities with lots of stop streets, you won't have to constantly move your right foot between the accelerator and the brake pedal. Once you get used to the feel, one pedal driving is just better. Whether you're interested in reducing your fuel bill or reducing your carbon footprint or both, what kind of savings can you expect from a plug-in hybrid? All these figures come from the EPA website, fueleconomy.gov. The Toyota RAV4 is one of the most popular vehicles in America, and you can get it with a regular gas engine, a hybrid engine that doesn't have a plug, or the RAV4 PHEV. It used to be called the Prime model. As you would expect, the hybrid saves money over the internal combustion model, and then the plug-in hybrid saves money over the hybrid model only when you plug it in. The EPA calculations factor in the cost of charging the PHEV at home. A level one charger draws about as much power as a refrigerator, but you're only running it part of the day while the fridge runs 24 seven. So it's not really a big add to your electric bill. This is true for other PHEVs when you look at the numbers. Ford Escape, same thing. Plug-in hybrids are easy to live with. Plugging it in doesn't make you a communist. Climate change is real, and electric vehicles are more efficient. Even when you factor in the manufacturing of the battery and the production of electricity, battery electrics and plug-in hybrids will reduce your CO2 emissions and reduce the money and time spent waiting in line at Costco Gas. There are various studies that all come to the same conclusions. I'll put links to them in the notes. I look at it this way. If you want to get a dog, you should be willing to take it outside and walk it. There are lots of benefits to you. If you don't like the sound of that, then get a cat. Meow. Likewise, if you want to get a PHEV, plug it in. There are lots of benefits to doing so. And if you can't or won't plug in your plug-in hybrid, then you should go for the most fuel-efficient vehicle you can find, which is probably going to be a hybrid.